nga mihi nui kia koutou, ko, ko Cheryl Doi tōko ingoa no o te tahi a hau. Uh, I um, come from Christchurch, o te tahi, and um, you can see some of the slides of the uh, the, the um, Port Hills and the, the plains of, of uh, Otetahi and also the Otakoro uh, River, the um, the bridge that was there over the, the footbridge over the uh, Avon River, Otakoro, before the earthquakes and the new bridge that has just gone into place in, in recent weeks. And I guess uh, I want to start with this just in terms of the Kawaiyo because in the future space, as in every space that we're working in, our place and our history and all of the um, our upbringing, um, our culture makes a difference in in terms of our, our assumptions, and that's really connected with the future. And I do want to also frame it in terms of generations. So uh, I uh, have a, a family that spans five generations, 90 years. So in the photo, my great granddaughter, uh, Maisie, uh, through to my uh, my mother who's holding Maisie and those generations are an important part of considering the future. So um, just to, to frame that up a bit more, Roman uh, Krasnarek talks about the, um, the importance of being a, a good ancestor and this is one of the slides from his book which I highly recommend, The Good Ancestor, uh, and just sort of frames it from just those minute pieces of uh, time that are known as seconds through to centuries. He talks about the importance of um, creating the, um, the legacy for seven generations, which fits in really well with indigenous thinking. And um, so the, the, um, the acorn brain rather than the marshmallow brain is one of the terms he uses. And I, I think it's just useful for us in terms of grounding ourselves and being here today that We've got our sort of public persona and we've got our personal persona. And in the future space, they're, all, they're both really um, important. But we're so caught up, especially in the current circumstances, by those things that are right down the, the bottom, the minutes, hours, days and months, that we're really in reactive mode. And so it takes a, um, the ability to step outside that, to look into uh, and explore what's in the wider world to bring into the future space. So the work in the, of futures and foresight is really about looking out into future times, uh, whether it be three years, five years, or a hundred years, um, and bringing that back into today. Um, so that's the, I guess, the framing. Um, and, and of course, uh, it fits in really well with Matariki, it's exciting that we are ha having our first uh, public holiday coming up uh, with, with Matariki and the nine stars of, of Matariki. I'm not a, an expert in this field. I'm just a, a beginner like many of, of you, but there are two stars really that focus me uh, from a futures perspective. And the first one you'll see down the bottom is Pohutukawa, which is the, the star that's focused on um, or associated with those who have passed on. Uh, and so in the future space, as I said, the who we are and um, how we have formed into the, the being that we are is really important. And the other star is Hiwa Iterangi, which is um, I sort of think of as being the, the future star or the wishing star. And it's um, associated with realizing our aspirations for the coming year. So those two, I think, are, are really important. And as we lead into Matariki, I think it's a great time for us to establish some new traditions that guide us into the future. Uh, so not traditions of let's have fireworks displays and um, uh, those sorts of things, but let's have quiet time where we just reflect and move from the dance floor to the balcony. So just to frame that up in um, the, the three parts of the work that I do in the future, in the future space, um, where people say, what does a futurist do? Um, I say, well, don't have a crystal ball. Um, I, what I um, always talk about is futures, not future. So there are multiple futures and sometimes you'll see, you'll um, see or read or hear people talking about 10 trends for things or or the um, the latest technologies etc that's a that's a, a small snippet of um, 
futures because the, <clears throat> the, the work of a futurist is often in the space of anticipation, not prediction. So no, no crystal ball. I can't predict what will happen in the anticipation space. That foresight is being able to look to all the possibilities to really sort of scan the environment and then bring that back in today. And that's um, a really important part of strategy, the strategic thinking that goes before strategic planning. So te wā mua, the past, the hindsight that we bring in, te wā tu, the present, and this is where we gain the insight, and, um, and then te wā heke, the future, the, the place of foresight, and um, <clears throat> the, the, these all weave together. So in, in, uh, in cosmology, everything's holistic, um, and there's no separation. So in some cultures, they will say future is yet to come. Um, and uh, the, the whakatauki, kia whakatumuri te haere whakamua, I walk backwards into the future with my eyes fixed in the past is uh, I think a, a, a really good whakatauki for us to um, ground ourselves in our current space. So strategic foresight, like this is a this is a, a, a whole masterclass. So, um, but but just a little bit about strategic foresight. Um, it is it is an actual discipline of its own. There are future studies and training that you can do in the space. And I sort of liken it a little bit when people talk about, say, design thinking or coaching. We can all do it. There's a whole lot of tools, etc., that you can just download and have a, have a go at and I'd encourage you to do some of that in the future space but there's also a whole way of thinking in academic study that underpins this work so it's not airy fairy sort of space it is um, a discipline and there are heaps of um, a really amazing tools and strategies but the key thing is that divergent thinking that in this space um, how are you as a leader really exploring all the possibilities rather than being really um, uh, stuck in the here and now or a one size fits all. And in the, the space of, of um, today where we've got the three C's, COVID, uh, conflict and climate change, those things aren't going to go away. And so the, the, that um, ability to pivot, to, to work in uncertain times and acknowledge complexity, that's the space that is the strategic foresight space. And so what I like, though, is to say what it isn't. Um, so if you have a look at this slide for a, a moment, you'll get, you'll get the general picture about um, strategic foresight. It's in the, the complex domain. It's, um, it's never just one future. We might have what's called a preferred future, but we also explore all the other different futures. And we prepare for the negative futures as well, because otherwise we are... Um, uh, we're not as prepared when things don't go the way we had hoped that they will. And there is a whole body of literature um, and research in the futures literacy foresight space. Um, UNESCO, they've got a whole, uh, a whole focus area on futures literacy and uh, futures literacy labs. And, and so you can go online and have a look at the, the, the um, tools and uh, dig deeper into the whole meaning of, of futures literacy, but you can see the reasons why you might want to engage in it. And you'll um, maybe also think that ties in absolutely with what you're doing in your space as uh, leaders already. So it's not new, it's just framing it in terms of a, um, a, a different space. So again, you can have a look at those later. The slides will uh, be available. And I do encourage you to go and look at the work of Rio Miller and Luz Demhoff in the futures literacy space. The other place that's useful to look um, for, for ideas in the, the futures space is from um, this resource. So last year, um, Valerie Hannon, who was the innovation um, unit 
which was based in the UK. It's also in Australia and New Zealand. She does um, amazing work and research, and so does Anthony Mackay. They put together this, this piece on uh, the future of educational lead leadership, and they, they highlighted five signposts. I'm not going to tell you um, what they all are. You can go online and, and have a, a look. But they did mention um, the fifth signpost as being about leading for futures literacy. And what all this research um, says is that futures literacy is a, a capability, so you can learn it and strengthen your muscles in this sort of space. It's a skill that allows people to better understand the role of the future and what they see and do today. Um, and, and what they say in this is that being futures literate empowers the imagination, enhances our ability to prepare, recover, and invent as change occurs. So again, um, the, the powerful thing about working on your futures muscles is that it really encourages you to think about your own assumptions and um, the hopes and dreams that you have and why you have those. So uh, really considering who you are as a leader, first of all, and that's why um, this is a little snippet of futures, but it's the ongoing conversation and scanning and um, being able to use some of the tools and strategies that helps to continually um, explore your own way of, of thinking. Um, it also helps to uh, look outwards and bring in. So there's a whole lot of, of ways that people scan or look outwards for things that are happening in different industries or in different parts of the world and then using that to think what does that mean for, for me what are the things maybe on the fr fringes that I just need to keep an eye on um, what are the what are the weak signals the, the sort of the sort of things that they're not trends but they're just little snippets that if they come together could do something quite um, quite different than we were expecting. And I think um, in the five signposts for um, leadership in the future, the imagining multiple and diverse futures so we don't become path dependent, for me, that's the critical um, thing that we should be exploring. And it's just exactly the same thing we should be doing with our, um, our staff, our students, um, to help them not to take one pathway. Otherwise, when things go wrong, they've got nothing to draw on. Um, so it's a, a sense of agency that becomes really important. And, and just for the, the last part of this slightly um, short deep dive into um, futures uh, is the whole idea of different forecasts. So some of you may have, have seen some scenarios um, that are placed in the future, but essentially um, what that looks like is uh, there are some dark futures in, um, in your organization on your own personal future, there are some things you think, mm, oh, I hope that doesn't happen. That's not that's not so good. Um, the, what we call the zone of growing desperation. So that the negative future is really important still to, to be thinking about what could go wrong. Um, the expectable future. So that's the, the conventional expectation. It's the business as, as usual. We might just make a few tweaks to what we're doing, but um, you know, really we don't want to go too far outside of that zone. And, and I guess the place that uh, I'd like to take us a little to um, in the tool that we'll explore shortly, the aspirational zone in, in terms of, you know what, we want to move forward because the times are changing and we need to be able to move with it and not expect to go um, back to the place that we were. Uh, so um, those people who are longing just for this time to be over so we can get back to normal, um, that's not the aspirational space and, and actually it's not the plausible space either. So um, that's just a little snippet into um, some, of the, some of the ideas tied into um, futures. I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll move on um, because in the, the blurb, I said we'd, um, we'd share a tool. And so I was thinking, oh, which one will I share? Because there's just, there's a whole lot of different um, programs and, and ideas. But the one that uh, I, I'd like to share with you is this one, um, which is called the Futures Triangle. And um, 
the reason for sharing this is because I think it's, it fits in really, really well with the, uh, the idea of matariki, but also with the, um, the complexity of uh, the world that we live in. And so it's a, it's a practical tool as well as one that's, that's um, a, a futures focused tool. So it's a futures triangle and you'll see that it's got three parts. I'm just going to explain a little bit about that. We're going to have a bit of a, a play um, uh, by ourselves and then in, um, in some, some groups. So welcome to the futures triangle. Um, and there's three, three parts to this. Let's start with the weight of history. And so just in thinking about um, maybe a change that you're thinking of, of making or something you want to explore in that, that future space, um, and it may be personally or it may be professionally, but the first thing is just thinking about what are the weights of history that hold us back or that um, have been part of this this. Um, in the, the, this way of thinking in the past, there may be barriers to change or that they're actually so deeply ingrained in the psyche personally or organizationally or culturally that they are really, really uh, difficult to change. They're not necessarily always bad, but you do need to consider them and they, they may look different. Um, with them, there may be some that are common um, to all of us, but there are also some that will be quite different because of our different place and um, our different circumstances. So that's the first one, the weight of history. The second one is the push of the present. And we, this is where a lot of us are spending our time at the moment. And um, it's just we're just overwhelmed with um, those, those things in the, um, the span of time that are here and now. Gee, we've got five people away and five staff away. Uh, what are we going to do in terms of, of covering our classes? Or um, there's this change of regulation. Yesterday it was this, today it's that. Um, we've got 80% of our, um, our workforce um, working online. How are, we, how are we going to cope with, with that? Have we got enough devices? All of those sorts of things that are in the here and, and now um, world. And so this is very much in the today and the very near future. And if we stay in just the push of the present, um, that's the, the space of overwhelm and probably where we'd be going back into that dark future, Carolyn. And then the third is the pull of the future. And so if you think about where you would want to head with something that you are working on, it may be a change process in your school, uh, in your organization, it may be something personally that you want to do, a change of role, a change of occupation. Okay, uh, why? Um, but what is that, that deep feeling that wants, that, that makes this so compelling? And so it's a pull. It's like, I've just got to do this because I can't not go there. This is just so critical. Uh, and in a, a schooling situation, for example, we know that we've got lots of things to deal with in the here and now. But what is the, the work that we are um, moving towards that is so important for our, um, our young people? And how are they also pulling us to this space? So um, these three things go together. And um, one of the powerful ways of thinking about this tool is it helps us understand the complex space. I work in the future space. I love um, the space of being more provocative and, and challenging. But if you only spend time in the, the pull and the conversation uh, about those things that need to, to change and you don't consider the past histories, the weights of the past or the pushes of the, of the present, then you're not going to achieve um, the, the changes that you want. And so those, those three, pretty important. Um, and the interaction of them is pretty important. And I'll, I'll share some of the ways that that um, might work in a, um, a moment. But um, so my question, uh, if we go, go back to the, oops, go back to the tool for, for a moment, just thinking about that, from a personal perspective or from a professional perspective. It's, um, it's just a, a few minutes of quiet reflection to think if this was the, uh, the triangle, what are the things I would write down for myself in terms of weights, pushes and pulls and what's the interactions? So um, 
just to deepen that conversation a, a little bit more, you've got some thoughts perhaps about um, the, the, the tool and what it uh, might be useful for. And if you think about the past, present and future and how they uh, interweave, I think that's a pretty um, significant part of using this tool. And so the, the idea of moving from strategic thinking before you even look at strategic, strategic planning is a critical one for this work. Um, lots of us have a propensity to action and you'll see that action oriented is the last thing on this list there's a lot of consideration and thought um, thought provocation that can be done using the triangle and it's a really useful um, tool to use when you're working with a group because it also helps to unpack people's assumptions about uh, the future and therefore the effect that they'll have so um, the First part is mapping the situation by uh, populating the information in the three parts of the triangle and then to, to have a conversation about the tensions and interactions and the parts, how they, they weave together, and then to consider some strategic cho choices before action. So in this um, particular example, we were looking at the future of work and we were just uh, talking about it from a, a, a um, generic sort of way of looking at the, the future of, of work. And you'll see that um, some of the things that we jotted in the weights of the history, the, the silos and the privilege and who has the power bases um, and some of the things on the, the push, the um, business as usual, just the geopolitical uncertainty, et cetera. But in the, the top area, um, some of the, uh, the areas that we were looking at, this is the pull. These are the things that we, um, we saw as the future of, of work. And it was focused on business as next um, and looking at the difference between robustness and resilience. You can see that we just simply jotted down some ideas and then we started looking at, well, which bits would we move towards and how much of a weight and a push would we consider? What's the, the mix? And one of the tools that's useful to then move forward is to say, well, if we wanted to uh, strengthen in the push lighten the weights or champion the pulls what are some key things that we would do and then which of of which one or two of those are most compelling bearing in mind that you actually do want to be um, uh, working on the pulls but sometimes you have to work on a weight or a push um, before you do that all right so one of the most powerful ways uh, of keeping uh, you're thinking towards the balcony rather than the dance floor uh, or otherwise in the, in the future space is the framing of the questions and the type of questions that you ask. Um, there's a whole piece on how you develop your, your focus question and um, this is just a little snippet of, of that work but just to, uh, to take your thinking to a, a different place. The question of how do we stop truancy in our school? We know that we've got lots of, of our young people, for example, that aren't um, coming to school at the moment for a whole range of different um, reasons. We ask that question, but here's a different question. So these may be to do with the same sort of problem, but they're framed in quite different ways. And therefore, what you do next uh, is completely different. Um, one is more punitive and negative, and the other is more uh, positive and looks for different opportunities. There's some some people uh, read this and say, well, why would we want to create a school that no one wants to leave? That's a different question, although it's, it is part of the conversation. And what are the, what's the assumption about that, that that's a good thing? So questions really are powerful. And uh, then if you look at, at some of the other um, types of question, uh, questions. Uh, I used to be principal at, at Fendleton School. If we said, what's the, the future of Fendleton School? That's a really, really specific question that narrows our thinking. What's the future of schooling, of education, of learning? You can see that they, they have slightly different nuances and therefore it finds scanning, which is one of the main tools in the future space. What do I look for Am I just looking at schools or am I looking at uh, wider aspects of learning? Am I looking at uh, adult learning? Uh, am I just looking at uh, young people? Am I looking at the demographics, the population changes and what effect that has, the technologies, et cetera? Uh, what does learning look like 10 years from now? Each of those 
asks a slightly different question and therefore I and my team would go off and investigate some different things. So think carefully about the types of questions that you ask and think about how they might lead you into future conversations. And so when you get to the, these slides, this one for me is a, a, critical, a critical starting point. Um, throughout your meetings, personally and professionally, these are some of the, the, the types of questions that you might ask to keep pushing you to think into the future, to think differently and to never be there yet. Um, so just take a, a moment to look at those questions and maybe select one that you think, you know what, I could use that tomorrow. So I guess um, where I want to finish with is that legacy thinking uh, keeps us in today's world and we are bound also by the, the way uh, the future has been colonised by those um, who've come before us and so we started with, uh, with Matariki and the stars and to, to ground that um, back to the work of um, the good ancestor is the types of, of, think, of ways of thinking long are the space of futures uh, as I said, great book, cathedral thinking, planning projects beyond a human lifetime. Now that might be at the, the top, of, top of the pull uh, for the future, or that might be seem to be a little uh, too big, but what's that one thing that I can do that creates some sort of a initiative moving forward that gets me closer to um, something that has a, a much bigger impact on uh, generations in the future. So uh, again, encourage you to have a look at that book. Started with uh, Matariki and I want to finish with grounding that back to the land because everything is, is woven and uh, the question I'll leave you with is how will you be a steward of the future today and, um, and to use this, uh, this metaphor of the braided river that our actions today impact future generations so downstream uh, the downstream effects of our actions really matter. And so I just see it as the good ancestor work that's been talked about uh, leads to positive potential and enables multiple futures. Whereas the myopic future, just a, a view that there's a, a one way of, of working or a, um, a one viewpoint takes you to negative potential and um, to colonizing the future and everything that we do does affect the future. So I'd rather enable multiple futures rather than um, colonize the future. So um, that's me. I'm going to stop sharing. If you do want to know some of the, the other th other things that um, uh, I work on in terms of communities of practice, uh, always um, welcome to reach out. And I'm going to um, just hand back to you, Judy. <laughs>